Uh, we're going to continue with Dr. Bradley Anwalt, uh, who is going to present the final lecture for this year, entitled uh, The Race for the Long-Delayed Male Birth Control Pill. Dr. Anwalt is a professor and vice chair of medicine at the University of Washington School of Medicine. He's also chief of medicine at the University of Washington Medical Center here. <clears throat> He served as Associate Chief of Medicine and Associate Care Line Manager of Primary and Specialty Care. He has also served as Director of Residency Ambulatory Care Training at the Veterans Administration Puget Sound Health Care System. And he was the Associate Program Director for Internal Medicine at the University of Washington. His current research interests are in male contraception, male hypogonadism, and reproductive physiology. He earned his medical degree from the University of California at Davis in Sacramento, California. He did his internship and residency in internal medicine here, and he did an endocrinology fellowship at the University of Washington. He has won many awards, including Best Doctors in America and Seattle Magazine's Top Docs Award. He's a competitive runner, oops, competitive runner, participating in both 5K and 10K races. He also is an avid skier and spends time uh, um, on Crystal Mountain. He also uh, does uh, some skiing with his family. And Dr. Anwal has two guests for us tonight that he's brought to expand on his talk. No further ado, I'll have Dr. Anwal come up. So first I'd like to have Steve Owen and Michael Lehman stand up. I'd like to have a nice round of applause for the uh, two who volunteer to come in. Go ahead and have a seat. I'll be bringing them up to have them answer a few questions about our clinical trials, and I'll have you, you have an opportunity to answer, ask questions of them. Uh, both of these uh, men have participated in a number of our male hormonal contraceptive trials. Uh, one also participated in a testicular study. I think I better read this, uh, get my glasses on. This is the one where you had a fine needle aspiration where you take a little fluid out of the testicle, is that right? So we're trying to uh, answer two questions here. Why doesn't the sperm concentration drop to zero in all men taking a hormonal contraceptive? And just what does it take to, to uh, uh, prevent subjects from signing up for our studies? <laughs> <laughs> so I want to show you the scientific rationale for the testosterone nesterone hormonal contraceptive study that both of these men participated in. So I'm going to show you again the figure that Dr. Amory showed earlier in the hour. And this is the, uh, the figure he describes as the brain elegantly regulating the testicles. I'm going to ask the audience, when was the last time you saw the brain elegantly regulating the testicles? <laughs> Only in science. So just to remind you, the hypothalamus sits in the middle of the brain. It produces a hormone, GnRH, which stimulates the pituitary to make two hormones, FSH and LH, which in turn stimulate two sets of cells in the testicles, the Sertoli cells and the Leydig cells, to produce testosterone. High levels of testosterone in the testicles and in combination with FSH result in spermatogenesis and normal sperm counts. If a man takes testosterone by gel or any other method and combines it with a progestin such as nesterone, so these men both took testosterone gel and nesterone gel for a number of months, what happens is you turn off the secretion of FSH and LH from the pituitary, which in turn disrupts production of testosterone and downregulates sperm production. Now some of you who are very astute in the audience are asking the question, if you turn off testosterone production in the man, aren't you going to prevent normal sexual function, muscle development, and skeletal development? But the testosterone gel that they're self-administering maintains normal testosterone levels and prevents these effects. So these men that we recruited were ages 18 to 50. They were all healthy, taking no medications. They took testosterone and nesterone gel for six months. They underwent monthly examinations, which included measurement of the testicles with our friendly Prader orchidometer, 
This is the normal male testis, adult male testis, somewhere between this size and this size. This is the testis of a prepubertal boy. I must say that uh, I take these with me when I go on talks, give talks uh, abroad and in the United States. And the fastest I've ever been through TSA is when they pulled this out of my bag and asked me what it was for. <laughs> so, Remember, the goal of male contraceptive trials is to stop all the swimmers. So a second part of our studies is these intratesticular hormone studies. And really the rationale behind this is the following. We know that male hormonal contraception is effective in preventing pregnancies. And it's effective despite the observation that many men who are taking these male hormonal contraceptive regimens still have a small number of sperm. Now, I'm going to put quotes around small. Uh, many of the women in the audience might be a little worried at the notion that a million sperm is small. But nonetheless, it's been proven to be effective. But we've asked the question, why do some men continue to make sperm while on a male hormonal contraceptive? And so to answer this question, we've, an event, or we've developed a procedure, the testicular aspiration procedure, where we anesthetize the testicle by injecting some lidocaine up into the spermatic cord where the nerve that travels down to the testis resides. And then we take a butterfly needle, a small one, and aspirate a certain quantity of fluid out of the testicle. So this slide is a uh, picture of a uh, recent picture of me in my office. And it's to remind me that uh, when a good friend of mine met me a few years back, and I had a newborn, I had a two-and-a-half-year-old, and a four-and-a-half-year-old, and, four and, and I told him that I was working on a male contraceptive. He paused, yeah, you better work on that. <laughs> so what I'd like to do is bring Steve and Michael up to the front here. Uh, I'm going to ask them a couple questions. I'm going to invite the audience to ask some questions. If you have a question, I'm going to ask you to move to where the microphones are, get close to the microphone, and ask your question. So Steve and Michael, would you come up here? A nice round of applause for them being willing. <laughs> willing not only to participate in our studies, but also to, uh, to answer your questions tonight. So Steve, would you be willing to, if this were a Facebook page, would you be willing to describe a little bit about who you are, what you do, what you do for fun, uh, what's your marital status, I mean all the things if I befriended you, which you will not after tonight. <laughs> uh, tell them a little bit about yourself. Okay, um, well I've been married, uh, and this, this August will be for 15 years. Um, I just turned 39, um, uh, avid cyclist, uh, enjoy reading comic books and science fiction, um, an educator in the Kent School District. Um, that's about it. Okay, <clears throat> excellent. Michael, would you be willing to disclose a little, a little bit about yourself? I've been married since 2003. <laughs> and, <laughs> good, uh, good. Yeah, I have, we'll call uh, your wife. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm a landscape designer. I'm approaching being 39. I've lived in the Seattle area since 1998. I grew up in the Bay Area. I've uh, been kind of moving north. Um, decided this is as far as north as I'm going to go. And um, I have two sons. I have a two-year-old who just turned two on Monday. <clears throat> and I have a five-year-old who will be five. Well, he's not yet five, but he'll be five in May. Um, I live in West Seattle. I enjoy uh, hiking and bicycling and skiing and the general fun outdoor activities that are available in this part of the world. So what, what the audience wants to know, because you guys look apparently normal, very healthy, intelligent, they want to know why you volunteered for these, uh, these studies. Either one of you? Yeah. Okay. Um, I forgot to mention I have a four-year-old daughter as well. Um, Initially, the, uh, to do the studies kind of caught my ear. Um, I'd been married for several years, and, and we got married fairly young, and we knew that we didn't want to have kids, and, or have kids at all. Um, and my wife had already been on taking the pill probably six or seven years, and we figured that even though there were some positive uh, benefits of taking the pill, that um, it would be nice if there were some male opportunities to uh, contribute as well. Um, so I was listening to sports radio, 
one time, um, just one time. And <laughs> that was it. <laughs> yeah. And I uh, heard, uh, you know, the um, opportunity to participate in a study and thought it would be a great opportunity to possibly, you know, selfishly have an opportunity for myself to uh, be involved in something like that that might be potentially developing a male contraceptive. Excellent. Michael? Um, I was... Uh my reasoning is based on my interest in science and my concern about general population growth. Um, at the time, um, know, my general life history up to that point had been just using general um, condoms as a contraceptive along with my partners, um, mostly were beyond birth control pills. And uh, I've always thought it was a little one-sided. Um, and I said, I'm kind of concerned about the general health of the planet and the what I can perceive as being an overpopulation growth and I just was I think I saw an ad in the stranger and I said oh that's kind of interesting uh, an interesting study um, I had some free time and uh, got a little extra money and trying to help with the the general progress of uh, science in general appealed to me yeah I will disclose that our two richest uh, recruitment media are sports radio and the stranger <laughs> So uh, would you be willing, the two of you, to describe a little bit about the experience of being in these studies, how you felt, what it was like? Sure. I'll go first, yeah. I, um, I've only been in, uh, th I believe, three studies so far. I, uh, Steve has been in quite a few more than I have. But um, I'd say they're all, they're all positive experiences. Um, the, the most stressful part was just getting to the UW from wherever I was working at the time, fighting traffic. I'd say it was the most stressful part to get here. Um, but other than that, uh, taking the regimen, I think may, I might have forgotten once to take it. Um, I was, the studies I, I, per, I participated in were the gel, so applying a gel to the, the shoulder areas uh, every day, uh, along with injections. Um, I did one of the studies that was uh, the implant, which I, I thought was very um, easy to deal with, and, and if, if there was an implant option available to me nowadays, I think I'd probably choose that one, a little less to, to remember. Um, in terms of, you know, I usually shower in the mornings, or in the evenings, so it was easy to, to put on the gel in the morning, not worry about any sort of cross-contamination with my, well, my wife at the time. So um, I, think, I think it was overall a positive experience. I didn't experience really any sort of mood swings, um, I didn't, I had a little bit of acne, but it was on my scalp, so it was nothing that I felt would be um, a, a problem socially. Yeah, it was a good experience. Um, and I think Dr. Amory mentioned that the studies have been about 30 years um, of this type of study, and I've been in about 10 or, 10 or 11 of those years, so contributed my share to this uh, cause. Um, but yeah, I've participated in the, the whole range of from testosterone, applying that, um, to the testosterone injections, to the implants. Um, <clears throat> and you know, honestly, I'm a person who doesn't like to rub things. You know, my wife will complain about, you know, going for long bicycle rides and not putting on sunscreen. So to actually put on gel uh, daily for like six months or a year was a real pain, uh, not very comfortable for me. Um, but as an option, it would be something that I would look at. I personally agree with Michael that the implant was, it was a year of not having to worry about anything, <clears throat> excuse me, um, other than just probably the initial week or two of discomfort and then uh, removing and just kind of having the anticipation of having a minor procedure to remove it. Um, the aspiration studies also were kind of um, scarier to, to to describe or to hear about, um, but the actual procedure itself, I mean, it, it looked kind of scary too with that, the syringe thing, but um, it really, you know, having just undergone that procedure last Friday, um, it's really, it takes about 10 minutes and it's, I wouldn't say any more uncomfortable than um, a blood draw. I mean, it's, it's really not that bad, so. Um, I will be taking names and numbers of those of you who would like to volunteer for our studies. <laughs> so you've mentioned a little bit some of the negative side effects. Did you have any positive side effects or any other negative side effects during these hormonal trials that you were in? So you mentioned acne. You didn't like putting the gel on. Were there any other side effects that you noticed, either positive or negative? 
I think the, the only negative thing would be, um, well, I like getting out hiking, backpacking, and if you're out in the middle of the woods, it's you know, having to apply a gel from a little plastic tube is a little bit of a, a, a no, an annoyance, but it's a little bit of a, a hindrance to the, the experience of backpacking out in the, in the wilderness. <laughs> but other than that, I, I had no, no bad. You probably ought to keep it out of the food bag so it exactly. doesn't get mixed up. <laughs> Um, I'd say a positive was uh, there definitely is an interest in males and females for a male contraception um, because usually at, at most get-togethers or social events where I don't know a lot of people, I'm the guy that everybody wants to talk to, like, you know, the, <laughs> the, the research guy. Um, so um, I'd say, you know, it, it's really cool to talk about it with people and say that there is something out there. And um, just recently I met someone else who was involved in a study, but in a, a, in a different state. I think it was Nebraska or something. But, um, yeah, really, you know, I had the same experience with a backpacking trip where it was, you know, I had my little bag of gel and the ones I'd used and the ones that I'd still had yet to use. Um, but, yeah, uh, I'm a routine guy as well, and so it was easy for me to either take a pill or do the, do the gel, you know, same time every day. So... So I can't quite be Dr. Phil or Oprah and walk around the microphone. So if you do have questions, please go to the aisles and line up behind the microphones. I've got a couple more questions for you. Um, you both have children. Um, any anxieties about taking a male hormonal contraceptive and potentially the effects that it might have on your offspring? Um, well, um, I, I know I, I didn't have children at the time that I was taking to participate in the studies. Um, I think nowadays uh, the, the gel would be a little bit of anxiety, but I know that you know you, you wash your hands and soap and water, and it's it's no big deal, I guess. Yeah. So, so you're a little concerned the gel might rub off on yeah, your little boy or little girl. Or her clothes, but you know we we wash our clothes, and that's yeah. It's just taking precautions, I think, is would be the thing. Um, and yeah, before we, you know, when we decided that we were going to have children or start the, the process, um, my wife wanted me to go through like a, a purification phase. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> a year or so of cleaning out, you know, my system of any, you know, drugs or hormones or anything that might be, you know, in my system or in my body. Um, and I have to say that I had a little bit of anxiety, you know, maybe two or three percent. That was just... I hope, you know, my daughter comes, you know, my child comes out, just everything's okay. Um, but that was, you know, really alleviated, you know, just upon seeing her. It was, you know, and everything's great with her, so as far as I know. So your wives aren't here. We can't get their real responses. Um, but do you think that women in general and your wives in particular would trust the two of you to take a male hormonal contraceptive regularly if that were the mode of contraception that you decided to use? Uh, yeah, I think so, yeah. yeah. I mean, more of a fault to me because my wife just gets kind of tired of hearing about it or having people ask her about it um, and just having to see the stuff around the, the bathroom. I try and keep it, you know, tidy in my little spot so it's not necessarily, you know, all over the place. But, yeah, I mean, she gets, she, other than just kind of, getting tired of hearing about it or people asking her about it um, just because more it, it just been kind of being in the research phase at this point but I think if it were you, you know what I used as a contraceptive I think she would be all on board and I, I agree with that too um, I, I, I think one big thing that I've noticed in my wife a little bit of uh, personal information but after we had children even you know, after our first child after our second child she's decided not to do the birth control pill anymore so it it becomes more of a, a burden and well do we, we use condoms yeah and well if, if, is there an alternative to that and I, I think does her decision to go off the pill puts more uh, responsibility on my shoulders and to have that opportunity or another option out there besides uh, condoms as a birth control method or a reliable birth control method is uh, a big plus yeah, and I'd say the same with me you know I'd still go to the to the uh, drugstore and, and get the uh, giant size pack of condoms and uh, holding my daughter in one arm and you know the <laughs> basket and the other it's you know it's it's hard to you know not still just be a little bit conscious of that <clears throat> so really kind of a two-part question for for both of you uh, would you be willing to take a male hormonal contraceptive if we had one on the market and if so what would be the ideal type of male contraceptive that you'd like to see available um, I, I would, 
And I think, to, to me, the ideal would be an implant, um, even more so than a patch. Uh, it just, to me, it would be just one less thing to think about, to worry about. Um, and then the second would be uphill. Um, I, I think that as I get older, I get more into the things I do daily, my work, my job, my kids, and having to remember, oh, I have to take a pill. It's like, I have to remember taking my vitamins every day because my doctor tells me I got to take, uh, you know, fish oil or something. I mean, it's one more thing I have to remember to do. Now, I, I do remember most of the time, but sometimes I forget, or if I'm going on vacation, it's, it's a hassle to remember to have to pack all that stuff. So I, I think to me, an implant would be ideal. So a long acting implant that yeah. lasted for a year or longer would be the ideal, and then a pill would be the second choice. What about for you, Steve? Um, I, I agree. I, I really like the implant, uh, just not having to worry about anything. Um, but I'd say, you know, an injection over a period of six to eight weeks, and that's all you had to do. Just, you know, schedule a visit every six to eight weeks, and you got an injection. But nothing else, that would be ideal for me. Um, and then uh, a pill would probably be um, another suitable choice because, again, vitamins and, um, you know, the other daily things that, I'm, you know, I take, that's just a part of my routine. Great. Any questions from the audience for our two men? Both of you are in your 30s. Is there any reason you would choose a reversible form of contraception over a vasectomy, for instance, if you've decided to finish, you've finished with your families? I've considered a vasectomy. Um, I, I think uh, a lot of it has to do with the, um, uh, the uncertainty of um, life in general, I guess. And uh, you know, I, I, granted, I am in my 30s, but um, if God forbid something should happen to one of my children, um, you know, I, I, both me and my wife were considerably, uh, I guess the, the, the age of childbirth is, is moving further back, so having an option is, is something I would like to keep open. Um, and I guess it's just the whole surgery procedure um, and the cost of surgery I, I perceive as being, would possibly be greater than taking a um, reversible contraceptive, let's say, over a shorter period of time. Steve, any comments from you? Yeah. Um, and my wife and I are kind of back and forth. Do we want a second child? Um, so again, I'm 30, we're both 39. Um, and I think that you know, one day it's, yes, we're going to have another kid. Let's start planning for it. The next day, it's no way we're not going to do that. So it's nice to have that, the option of having something reversible like that. Any relationship to how your daughter behaves in the... <laughs> Direct correlation, <laughs> yes. <laughs> or how I behave. That's very good. <laughs> Question, ma'am? Yeah, I have one, but I also want uh, either or both of them to uh, decide they, want, they don't want to answer this question, and if they do, I'll understand. But I'm rather curious. Uh, did the children come roughly when you wanted? I, I'm assuming these were all three planned pregnancies. Um, did they come roughly when you wanted, or was there a day, delay, or did they come sooner than you thought they would after you went off the male contraceptive? How did that work out? So your concern is perhaps the contraceptive might have affected the timing? Yeah, yeah. Steve or Michael? Oh, I can go first. Um, yeah. So I, I honestly don't remember when my last study was. My, my first child was born in uh, 2006. So um, I, I want to say that I was off the medication, uh, the study medication, for at least uh, six months um, before we actively started to, to try to conceive. And I, I, think, I don't think we experienced any uh, difficulties, any any more difficulty than we would have normally. It's just a matter of you know, finding the rhythm, my wife discovering what her cycles were, and the, the general things that happen with uh, couples nowadays, you know, fitting it into our busy lives. So I, I don't feel that um, the, the medication or the study medication had any effect on uh, my abil our abilities to conceive um, either of our children. Yeah, and I think my wife and I schedule it so that she went off the pill and I stopped participating in studies about a year or so before and um, before we kind of anticipated would be a good time to conceive and um, one of the things too that was a benefit from the studies is I knew my sperm count 
pretty well. So I, I knew it wasn't, uh, I, I was definitely a contributor and everything would be fine on that side. So um, it, it, things went pretty well, I mean, pretty timely, so. Yeah, that, I think that was a benefit <laughs> to the, that uh, we, I, I knew that my sperm was viable <laughs> prior to our attempts, yeah. I think there's one more question. With women's contraception, we know that there's changes sometimes in mood, in body composition, and in libido. Did you notice any changes in any of those three categories? So the, the question, let me just see if I, I can repeat it so everybody can hear it. The question was, were there any effects on mood, libido, body composition, and so forth during the time they were taking this? Yeah, I, I know that those are side effects sometimes with female, um, females taking hormones. So I'm wondering if you noticed any changes or if your wives noticed anything? Um, I'd, I'd probably say I, I, there's a little bit of weight gain, and, and which is noticeable. And I, I'm usually you know, 145, 150, so a little bit of weight gain was noticeable for me, um, but nothing that made me feel uncomfortable or self-conscious. Um, and also being uh, really into physical exercise, um, I, did, I wasn't necessarily concerned about an excess of weight gain. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to be aware of too is if there were um, any effects on performance because you know, I do race competitively in the, in the area uh, in cycling and I want to make sure that you know, that wasn't going to be an issue. Um, but I did notice there, there would be times where I, I had a little less tolerance for things that I, I might snap just a little bit easier and pretty easy going guy but it wasn't like I would, I would rage and um, you know, it would last for days or even hours. It would just kind of be like, wow, I, I just kind of lost a little bit easier in that situation. Um, I, I, would, I would agree that it was the, um, a little bit of um, a slight mood swing towards aggression, uh, but I, it wasn't, uh, during the study we were, we would take logs and we were at every time that we'd go in to um, have a blood draw or such, we'd have a full out a survey that would rate our, our our general moods and feelings over the whatever the the last that whatever that study period was between visits and I I'm trying to think back as to what I rated things I think most of the time it was pretty even even mood I'm a pretty mellow guy and um, I, I'd say that any aggression that I did feel out of the norm was maybe when the study was just start starting or just stopping um, maybe just after an injection um, but in general it wasn't. I wasn't walking around raging at people all the time because, you know, as I think it was mentioned several times, the, the testosterone level isn't elevated. It's, it's the same pretty much, right? It's, so we're not getting more testosterone. It's just coming externally versus being more produced, yeah? Some of the levels a little bit higher than you would have at baseline, so okay. it depends on the man. Yeah. <clears throat> um, before I invite Dr. Amory and Dr. Bremner to come up and answer questions about their talks, I'd like to give a round of applause to these two for two reasons. One, I'm going to have you hold just for a second here because there's really two, two gifts here. One is to have the courage to come and share their experience with the public and answer questions. And the other one is, is their gift to science and to the community and thinking about the future and being a part of scientific development. So now is the time for the round of applause. Thank you. Okay. So, I'm going to invite Dr. Bremner and Dr. Amory up here. I know Dr. Amory had one question from several people, which is, uh, why can't we take a pill form? So, Dr. Amory, would you be willing to answer sure. that question? Yeah, that's a great question. You can sit over by the... Uh, oh. Um, the short answer is that the body chews it up. So you can take oral testosterone, but the liver in particular rapidly metabolizes it. This is an issue for contraceptive studies and also for treating men who are deficient in testosterone. Let's say a man's lost his testicles to cancer. We take care of people like this and we treat them with testosterone replacement so that they feel normal. Um, we don't really have a, a pill or an oral form of testosterone that's available on the market. This is another area of research that we're all working on is to try and develop something for those men and potentially for contraceptive development as well. Dr. Bremer, you quoted in your talk some uh, studies about which formulation men might prefer. Is there a general answer around the world? We got an answer from Steve that he thought an injectable form the last eight weeks would be good, and uh, Michael said that an uh, implant that lasted a year would be his preference. What's the worldwide experience on this? It's roughly a third, a third, a third, where the third 
preferring a, an oral pill, a third preferring an implant, as both of our gentlemen here today talked about, <clears throat> and a third preferring an injection as long as it's in the range of every three or four months. So something as short as a month didn't get as favorable a review. And something as long as a year or more didn't either because people were worried that they would want to change their minds. Uh, with an implant that lasts a year, you can take it out and, and, it's, and it's reversible. But if, if an injection that lasts a year, which we don't have anyway, but if there were an injection that lasted a year, people were concerned that, that they might change their mind in that interval and uh, want to back out and it would be not possible to do fundamentally. But with an injection given only every three months or so, people felt that was a reasonable balance between longevity of effect and ability to change their minds. Any other questions from the audience? And so my question is, it, with the injectable form, have you tried the self-injecting approach? In other words, the subjects would be able to administer the testosterone uh, themselves. Dr. Amory, would you like to take that question? So I, I really like that question because men who are testosterone deficient can be trained to self-administer the injections. In fact, we do that in clinical practice. We've not done that in the setting of a contraceptive trial, but I think it would be perfectly reasonable to test that in the future, especially as we come up with more effective methods. And that would be great because then you would um, disassociate the need to go see the doctor every eight weeks. You could actually give somebody a year supply and say, go ahead and inject yourself. With a little bit of training, almost anyone can learn to do it. So. Thank you. Question on the right or your left. You spoke about hormonal contraception for men. Can you talk to some of the other types of male contraception? Dr. Amy, would you like to comment on the other novel? Another one of my favorite topics. <laughs> um, so there are lots of people, including people here, who are interested in non-hormonal approaches to male contraception. The first thing you have to say, though, is they're not nearly as far along in terms of development as the hormonal approach, which is being tested in humans and clearly works in the majority of the cases. Most of the non-hormonal approaches are what we call preclinical. That is, they're not really being tested in humans. Um, but there are other approaches. Uh, one thing sperm have to do is swim. And that swimming process is dependent upon a variety of biological factors, including in particular calcium channels. So there's a group of individuals who are working on drugs that would block the specific calcium channels in sperm that are necessary for swimming. One attractive aspect of that approach is that it could, that kind of medicine could be taken more on an as-needed basis. Like when someone was about to have intercourse, if they took a medicine that stopped the sperm from swimming, it might be reasonably effective and would probably be reversible. So that's one approach. Um, we're also interested here, it turns out that uh, vitamin A is very important in sperm production. In fact, if you make a, an, a, a mouse or a rabbit, if you make them vitamin A deficient, two notable things will happen. The first is they'll get night blindness, which I think most people are aware of. The second is that they, men will become infertile. And so if you could actually devise a way where you could block the effect of vitamin A in the testis, independent of the effect in the eye, you might actually have a viable non-hormonal contraceptive. So those are just a sample of two approaches to non-hormonal contraceptive. A lot of people are interested in this, but in terms of development, it, it, it's trailing that of hormonal contraceptives. So is this why rabbits like carrots? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure, but they certainly are fertile, I will say that. Question over here, please. I'm a little curious about whether there is a uh, noticeable difference in the efficiency or effect of the um, hormonal um, on, on the, um, because I, I was wondering if there's any um, change due to downregulation or just tolerance to the hormone over the course of the experiment. So, so I think the question is, uh, do men start to have developed tolerance or stop responding to the hormones over time? Yep. Uh, Dr. Bremner, would you comment on that? Uh, yes, thanks for that uh, interesting question. There really isn't much evidence that that's true. That is, the response to the hormone stays pretty much stable over at least a year to 18 months that these studies have, have been conducted. There are rare men who get their sperm count to zero and then pop back up to two or three or four million transiently and then pop back down again. But that's, first of all, very uncommon and is not uh, a continual process where their sperm counts recover, for example, while they're still on the, on the suppressive regimen, implying that they might be 
becoming insensitive to it as you're as you're asking. Similar to the to the fact that men or women, for that matter, who also have testosterone, albeit at lower levels, don't become insensitive to it over the course of their adult lives. It, it continues to be effective in, in all its biologic effects uh, over years. Okay, thank you. I think we have time for one last question. I was wondering if there was an age limit. I mean, is it as soon as a young man produces sperm, he could take this birth control, or is there something in an adolescent that you have to be careful about? Uh, <clears throat> we set uh, lower age limits for our studies just to be sure that the men are at the you know, old enough to freely consent to, to participate. There's no particular biologic reason that we know of that, that an adolescent would be at more risk, for example, of having adverse effects from a, from a contraceptive of this sort. And as you know, probably women, girls use um, hormonal methods uh, as well as women. And uh, both the oral agent and the injectable DMPA is is commonly used in younger age groups. So we're not aware of any problem um, with turning off sperm production in younger males. Uh, just one last comment on that. <clears throat> in, in a kind of general biologic sense, most species are going through annual cycles of reproduction every year. So they're breeding seasons and then non-breeding seasons. So the testis is turned on and off uh, every year in most species other than domesticated animals and humans. So, and rabbits. So, uh, <laughs> so there's no evidence of, for example, problems with younger um, animals in those species or accumulated defects in, for example, the genetics uh, of the testis that might otherwise be a concern. In other words, no increased likelihood of, of adverse outcomes of pregnancies. So, so um, that may be a longer answer than you wish, but. So I'd, I'd like to thank the audience. Uh, Dr. Joyner is going to come up, but. Uh, I, have, I have one more question for you. Oh, we have as, one more question, as, but I'd like to thank the audience <laughs> for coming because we're very enthusiastic about this topic. So we, we love sharing that enthusiasm. As a urologist, we worry about testosterone in men who have not had a digital rectal examination and PSA. Uh, what, what can you say to men taking testosterone who have not, uh, and may have a family history, may be at risk for prostate cancer down the line? I, I, I think that, so the issue is really what's the side effects of testosterone on the heart and the prostate? You didn't ask about the heart. I, I don't care about the heart. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're a urologist, you're, you're heartless. <laughs> so, he might, I don't. Uh, so, um, and, and really, we don't have long-term data on the safety of administering testosterone to, to young men. Uh, we have an extensive, decades-long experience with administering testosterone to adult men, and there doesn't appear to be any evidence that it causes any serious deleterious effects on the prostate or the heart, but that question is still out. Uh, as far as a young man is concerned, we don't think that they need a digital rectal exam or a PSA, but if a man was over 40 or 50, depending on which clinical guidelines you believe in, um, we, would, we would argue that a digital rectal exam and a careful assessment of risk of prostate cancer would be advisable. But if you're targeting a younger population, which would be the first group that we would target, I, I think that's a largely uh, irrelevant concern. You know, we actually do do digital rectal exams and follow the prostate in all of these studies. studies of male hormonal contraception, and we've never seen anything like prostate cancer in any of these studies. So, and that's a fairly extensive worldwide uh, Great. experience with that. Dr. Brenner, you get the, he always gets the final word. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, there, there's not uh, evidence of, there's, there's actually better evidence in the heart that the testosterone would be beneficial than it would be harmful. And, that's not conclusive either, but that's, um, that would be the summary of all the epidemiologic and interventional studies. With the prostate, it's less clear. Uh, there actually are some urologists, as, as Byron knows, who argue that it's actually beneficial to the prostate too. Um, so anyway, as Brad said, we don't really know the answer to that question. It requires longer term studies with more people. Much. I want to thank our speakers tonight and thank all of you for coming to Mini Medical School. 
Congratulations on your graduation.